somebody buys your brand, there is a trust involved. And, and that trust, as we discussed about the selection process for consumers, that trust can only be reinforced if every time they're buying a bottle of wine, it, it tastes as, as, as good as it possibly can be. Um, I think uh, having an in-depth knowledge of your consumers, I think that's vital. Hi guys, welcome to the Wine, Whiskey and Weed Show. This is your host, Sid Patel. Thanks again for listening to this podcast. Now, this one is a very special one where I sit with Robin Koopstick, who is the managing director of a brand called iHeart Wines. Now, iHeart Wines is the 10th biggest wine brand in the UK market. It is exported to 46 countries and they sell 20 million bottles a year in just UK. So I chat with Robin, who is the creator of this brand, and we chat about the basic principles of brand building. Enjoy this podcast. Robin, thanks again for coming to the show. And so I'm really, really interested to, you know, understand the mindset, the foundational principles, and also, you know, how you uh, scaled this company. In the UK, we, we sold approximately 20 million, just over 20 million bottles in the year of 2019. So, um, Amazing. Yeah, so. And how many years... Uh, uh, on, on the first bottle sold? Uh, we launched at the end of 2011, so so really that's sort of eight, eight full years of, of trading in the UK. Great. And uh, total sales around the world? Um, just, just shy of 24 million in 2019. Superb, superb. So uh, just a little uh, context here. I mean, I myself have, you know, uh, sold wine and built wine. I had a private label, so I would love to understand uh, some of the process. And I'm sure, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs here are trying to grow their wine brand, uh, Robin. So I would, I just wanted to uh, get back on the foundational things, right? Like when, when you are designing a brand, I think a uh, lot of things have to go right, like from sales, distribution, the packaging, the design, the price, the liquid, the communication, and then sort of you can taste uh, this kind of success, right? So what's what's your thought on getting uh, all the checkpoints right? Or what are the important checkpoints to at least uh, have it in place before you even start? Sure. I mean, I, number one, I think you need you need a, a lot of good luck and you need a certain amount of, of good timing. Um, if I think back to to the days of Coke Stick Murray. Um, the, com- the company in the UK is now called Freshnet Coke Stick because Coke Stick Murray merged with Freshnet UK at the beginning of 2019. But back in 2010, we were we were Coke Stick Murray and we were a, a small but a very creative team of of sort of of individuals. And we had been creating brands for for other people, so we were behind the. The creation of Oggio, which got to two million cases, uh, we did that in conjunction with the Wine Exchange and Stranger and Stranger, um, and Tesco themselves. Um, we'd also been behind the the development of, of the McGuigan brand, uh, which is now in the top five of the UK brands. Um, we instigated um, all of that, um, and it really came out of the realization that we we needed to do something for ourselves rather than rather than for other people um, and we needed to as a company we needed to take charge of our own destiny but we were, we were confident in our ability to to get the distribution and what we needed was, was to get the, to get the right brand so we had a number of blue sky um, sort of brand development days where everybody in the company was encouraged to bring their ideas um, and in one such meeting in 2010 I was Handed just a, a doodle on a notepad, um, and it had I, and then it had a heart, and then it had Pina Grigio underneath. Um, I had a, I had an in, incredibly strong gut feeling at the time that this was this was um, this was really genius. I mean, it, it was the idea that I thought you know I was looking for. I took it to um, to Kevin Shaw, who was who was helping us with design in those days. Um, he and I were, were good friends and I trusted his judgment and the moment he saw the same doodle on, a, on the pad, he just put his uh, head to his hand and, and just, just had the same thought as me that this was, this was, a, um, this was the brand that, that could really do something. Um, but we didn't really stop there. We didn't just stop at, 
at two people's gut feel, we actually did do a quite an extensive amount of consumer research just to make sure that, that our our thinking was correct. Um, and that's, I think, a little bit where the good timing comes in because what has happened in the UK at that time was that consumers consumers in the UK do not know a lot about wine, and in many cases they don't want to know a lot about wine. But what they what they so were you had you had the focus groups in uh, supermarkets or we had the focus uh, groups from from, from okay. supermarket shoppers we had focus groups where we put I heart against the the key brands of the time okay um, and, and we, supermarkets uh, were also you were also testing them and taking their views I believe while while you you were testing all this well we were showing them the the research we 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 did it independently from them but we did it with their products so we mocked up. We mocked up what a what a supermarket shelf would look like, um, um, and the, you know the, that research has you know proved to us um, what we what we had thought that this was this was a brand that could get a lot of traction, and the reason was was you know what I was what I was trying to say earlier was that the UK consumer doesn't know a lot about wine, nor do they really want to know a lot about wine, but they did know. What's, they were beginning to know what sort of wine they really liked. So they were beginning to understand the Pinot Grigio brand. They were beginning to understand um, Merlot and, and Chardonnay and, and Shiraz. And, uh, in that respect, I think it's quite a unique brand because it's actually the consumer, by purchasing that bottle of wine, is actually telling you, the producer, what they like. Whereas if you think about other brands, you know, that is... That is Hardy's crest. That is yeah. That is you, you're building uh, yeah. varietal fans, basically, right? You you may, you're uh, building loyalty around the the taste. Exactly, and 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 putting some emotion into the brand, and also it was the other thing that was was so good about the brand was that it was um, that it was taking away traditional wine cues. This was something from everyday life. It was quite unique in that respect. This was. This was an image that people were used to seeing, but not necessarily to do with wine. And and it made it very simple and very easy and very uncomplicated for consumers to purchase it because wine is quite, to most people, wine is quite a daunting subject. So so it was unique in that respect. And so once we had the 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 confidence from the from the focus groups that this was a was a was a good brand, we then started presenting it to to supermarkets, not just in the UK, but but around the world. And, and actually, the first launch happened in the US with uh, Fresh and Easy, which Tesco owned at the time. But Fresh and Easy were the first supermarket to launch it. And we could see immediately from day one of sales that the brand um, had a lot of traction with customers. It did, it did incredibly well, even though Fresh and Easy as a chain did not do very well. The wine sales for Fresh and Easy and particularly for iHeart were, were extremely successful and gave us even more confidence to to attack the UK market. Um, so yeah, we had a we had a very fast start really in, in 2011 and 2012 in the US and then in the UK. Fantastic. I think one of the uh, core advantages uh, on your side is you, you had seen a lot of uh, success stories or failure stories being in the bulk and the private label side of things and helping the supermarket. So you had that machine, right? You had your own company who had flipped or sold or developed so many brands. So you, you also had seen a lot of merchandising, marketing, uh, consumer behaviors. So I think, uh, was your vision like from day one uh, this huge or it just happened organically? Like you just thought, let me also add a skew in Tesco. Um, I would say, that, you know, we had no idea that it would be as big as it was, but we did know, we, we did know the size of the prize and we knew how big some of the brands were going to be. So, so like, like was, it was more of a business diversification move, right? This wasn't correct. going to be your main business. This was a, this was about our company sort of taking control of its own destiny, knowing that we had the we had the the people uh, and we had the customers who who um, who could who could help this this brand grow, and, that, and that's proven to be correct. Do you believe uh, value or price 
is is the number one thing or it just doesn't matter uh like marketing overcomes uh sometimes you know like you can you can increase the price by a, a pound and uh have a strong marketing to digest and have more margins i think it's um i think in terms of the initial purchase uh the packaging is extremely important um of course it has to be within within a price band that, that is acceptable for that consumer and then in terms of the quality of the liquid you know that will be the proof in the pudding is whether that consumer comes back to buy the second bottle i think it's relatively easy to get somebody to buy the first bottle um but um the, the certainly in terms of that very first purchase i would put packaging slightly ahead of price but but within a sense of reality it has to be within within a price band that they're willing to pay yep so uh when i like study uh the successful brands or you know even in the spirits and beer side of things i think uh they most of the brands become go at this level is sheer uh, marketing and you know it, it's mainly the marketing and the the branding side of things and the execution for sure like you know knocking more doors and executing and depletion and things of that nature meaning more business instead of wine making and the and the romantic side of the wine business it's more like trade consumer marketing right uh what kind of lessons uh do you think you've you've seen uh work like for example let's say if you had 100 pounds to invest in marketing do you think floor merchandising or consumer adverts or social media adverts where do you where would you invest like for the best ROI in marketing? Um, I think a lot of that depends on the maturity of the brand. So if you're launching a brand, the most important thing is the distribution, not the consumer marketing. I think once you have... So the during the launch, invest in the trade, right? Yeah. I guess. Launch, invest in the trade. And then once you have the distribution, then you have to invest in the consumer. Um, and then that becomes almost self-effacing because if you're investing in the consumer and, the cons and you've got the distribution and the consumer wants to buy the product, then the retailer will, will give you the, the, the correct distribution and the correct floor space. So when you approach Tesco, let's say you had this uh, investment of marketing uh, sort of a deck, like, you know, floor stacks. If you bought like four cases per store, we'll give you a racks or floor merchandising. If you can please uh, like give us some insights on how you support your supermarkets. Yeah, I mean, I think a good example is at the moment um, in Sainsbury's, actually, there are, there are 300 discovery bays um, which are branded for iHeart. We've just launched um, a gin, which is, which, which is new. That's the first spirits to come out from the iHeart stable. Um, so that's all about discovery. So there's a gin. There's a, there's, we, we, we're doing iHeart cans as well. Um, there is a, there are some new new products in there. Um, yes, we you know we have made the investment to do that with Sainsbury's, but Sainsbury's are so confident in the brand, they've allowed us to to launch new 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 products inside that Discovery Bay. Uh, the feedback that we're getting from them is that this is best in class. This is the the best sort of Discovery Bay that they've seen, and and, it, and they're going to replicate it in the future um how do we convince them to do it we convince them that the brand is so successful with their consumers that 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 end of aisle that discovery bay will be so well shopped that, that the supermarket will the supermarket itself will get incremental sales um and and so far the the um the results are extremely good um so as long as those results continue they, that supermarket will say they've got incremental sales, therefore we'll have another opportunity to do something. If, this, if we don't get incremental sales, then clearly well, we won't. But, but so far, the results are, are very promising. But it's about, adding, it's about adding value and adding sales to, 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 to your customer. So you, I'm, I'm sure you do worry when, let's say, when a supermarket chain says, you know, last three months have been very slow. Uh, because you know the game, like it's just long-term relationship, right? What kind of things do you do to sort of uh, bring things back up? Like, are there any instant sort of promotional tactics, like in-store programs, or uh, which is proven formula to just kick back and you know get the sales rates high? I think that the, the data is incredibly important, and 
Um, I understand what you're saying. That's quite a general question. So the first thing that we would do is to try and understand why that, why why the sales had dipped, and and every, everything is is cyclical. Maybe we have the wrong product there. That's the first thing. Maybe maybe it's not. Maybe it's not their fault. Maybe it's our fault. But in the case of iHeart, it's not the brand. We know it's not the brand. So maybe it's up to us then to to switch the varietal or switch or switch the product. If we if we know that if we're then convinced that we've actually got the product right, then maybe it's down to to where it is on the shelf, and and therefore we have to work with the with the customer to um, to to change the position of the product or change the price or or make a promotion to get people buying into that SKU again. So there are many different reasons to why why you might have a slowdown in sales, but the most important thing is for you as the for us as the brand owner to understand why what you know the first thing is why why is it slowing down there could be a a multitude of reasons for that mm -hmm. a lot of people struggle with the reasons i mean you know uh, it's just because they are not that huge that they have this data uh, i would say wavelength with the supermarket or investment budgets right uh, can you give us uh, like you just give us a couple of reasons right it can be a mismatch it can be a brand it can be a wrong price it can be a placement so I'm sure uh, are, are, do supermarkets measure all this like are there like filters I mean I'm, I'm I don't know as well I certainly think the supermarkets in the UK have got a good understanding of, of like the they can give you a great the uh, explanation the um, like they can give you a data back the reason like okay this brand is not doing well because of this yeah, I mean, you know, um, if you look at if you look back ten, fifteen years ago, you know, um, and you if you look at the the trends at the moment, so something like Provence Rosé or, or a paler Rosé is doing very well. If you look at the the same data, you'll know that the tr the traditional Rosés are not doing so well. So. Um, um, if, if you think about Prosecco against, if you think about Prosecco against Carva, you know, if we had iHeart Carva next to iHeart Prosecco, iHeart Prosecco would sell it nine bottles to one. Um, so you can see, you know, it's it's it, those examples are pretty simple, but it's about understanding whether you've got the whether you've got the right product there in the first place, and not being afraid as a brand owner, not being afraid to say that's the wrong product. Let's put something else in. Of course, from a supermarket point of view, you know, from a supplier point of view, you might be thinking, I could lose the listing. But actually, in my opinion, it's better to be honest, risk losing the listing in order to gain a better listing. There's no point in, in putting something in there that is just not going to sell. That's not going to help either relationship. Absolutely. As a leader, uh, when you're launching into new international market or let's say new varietal you know uh, how much disciplined are you to listen to the data or you you still take risk and let's say japan is a very mature market or let's say some some varietal is declining right let's say uk itself is a tough market right uh, uh how like how how much of a risk or decision you base on the data or do you bet against it or do you trust the data i mean we trust the data but at the same time you you, you have to take a risk and you have to believe in 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 your product but we do for for international markets i would say that we're very strong at trying to make sure that we have the the right products going into into the right markets um we're lucky with iheart because uh, iheart is quite a unique brand in the sense that you can it can almost be anything um you know it could be I heart Sauvignon Blanc. If there was a country that was particularly fond of France, it could be I heart Beaujolais. Or it could be I heart Muscadet. Exactly. Let's say if, if Sauvignon Blanc is the number one white wine seller in, and the fastest growing category in US, for example, as you may know now, uh, it's it's a good idea to launch I heart Sauvignon Blanc, correct? Exactly. And so where we have an advantage over many brands, so, so if you think about Hardy's, Hardy's is going to be Australia. So if, the, if Australia is not popular in a certain country, Hardy's won't sell. With iHeart, we can say, okay, so France is popular there, we'll put French wine in that market, or Italian wine is popular there, so we'll put Italian wine into that market. So we we have a, a sort of bit of a USP there that we can do that. And because of our ownership, you know, we, we own wineries all over the world. So within reason, there's nothing that we cannot do 
um, if we feel that the 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 size of the prize and the and the volume aspirations are are, are going to be worth it for us. But you know that's one of the reasons why we've done so well internationally. Very nice. Uh, when it comes to international markets, right? I mean, you had amazing partnerships in UK and you had that leverage. But when you are entering into like a new, you, you got to make new friends and new relationships, right? Uh, how do you approach an international market? You know, let's say you are still just a small and medium sized supplier when it comes to an unknown country where you just don't have any relationships. I, I mean, it, it's clearly very difficult, but I, I think. Um, um, you know, one thing that we did, I think, that was very successful is is that we found markets that were quite similar to the UK. So, you know, if we go back to iHeart again, iHeart is always going to be more successful in supermarkets and convenience than it than it is in on trade. Um, that's just the nature of the brand. So, so what we did is we tried to find markets that were more similar to the UK, i.e a large portion of the sales came through other supermarkets and convenience. And then we would take those, knowing that we'd got the, the, the facts right at the market, we would then take the information, uh, the success back to the, the key distributors, or if you're, if you're allowed to trade directly with the supermarkets, but we would just share the information. We would show how successful we had been um, knowing, that, knowing that, that their market was quite similar to the UK. Yeah, I would just like to pause here. I mean, this is very interesting thing which you just said. Uh, no one has ever focused on the importer's customer. You know, that is one thing which you are being unique with, which is amazing. Like because your your model, your retail customer profile, you're sticking with that and then finding the market for that, right? And attacking instead of just a new importer for the sake of country. Yes, I mean, uh, amazing. Uh, yeah, yeah, I am. Uh, what's any any particular like selection process? Uh, I guess with this size of a brand, you would prefer to partner with a large company like Southern or like uh, or China, like a big player, right? Like or, or you you okay to go with regional sort of players? Uh, we, we would prefer to our our preference would be to go to to sort of medium or big companies because the success, you know, the the, the brand. Is going to do particularly well in market, so we need people who who've got the scale to to cope with our success. And and I guess who can service the supermarkets, who are authorized there, who know how to work with the supermarkets. Exactly. Yeah. There's no point in pretending we're going to be the number one seller in a three star Michelin restaurant, but we we could well be the number one seller in a in a good supermarket chain. Got it. Got it. Uh, super. I mean, uh, any any mistakes uh, that you may want to share that you've learned during this process of whole like include like business building you know forget about the brand like you have been a business operator so you've done again and again like what kind of principles and mistakes like some mistakes let's say people you should not do so they can save some money here yeah i mean some of the mistakes we made are, um uh, i remember quite early on in the brand's history we wanted to do some special editions so we got we we licensed artists to to add to the, to the label um, and do something specific for a limited edition. And, you know, limited editions do work with some brands, but actually they didn't work with iHeart because the beauty of iHeart is the simplicity of the label, and it seemed to even though it looked good, it seemed to take away somehow from the simplicity. Um, another example is you know, iHeart sits between sort of entry level and the sort of the, the mid-level pricing, um, we had amazing success very quickly with iHeart Prosecco. It looked amazing. Everybody wanted Prosecco. Some of our customers said, look, if you, you know, iHeart's an incredible brand. Why don't you make us just an iHeart generic sparkling and, and make it a real price fighter? And we, we sort of followed the, their advice and we tried to do it. But I think particularly this is a message that's, that's sort of specific to sparkling wine. Um, actually, that didn't work at all because the message that we got back from the consumers is that even though price was very important to them, when they open a bottle of sparkling wine, when they buy a bottle of sparkling wine, they want that to be very special. They're celebrating something. Even if they're celebrating on a Monday, it's a celebration. 
and therefore just to try and cut cost uh, for the sake of a pound retail price. That was not that was not worth it for the consumer. They wanted their sparkling wine to be. They wanted it to, to feel special, and and we sort of let them down on that sense. Um, and I think the other the other thing that, that stands out for me is that when we were launching, we tried to do some quite big um, events, um, but those events came actually before there was enough brand awareness. Um, Big so business to consumer events? Big consumer events, yeah. So I think okay. the, the message there is, you know, it's, it's, it's great to do it. It's good PR for the brand. But if you really want to, to have a successful consumer event, the, the, the consumers have got to know the brand well enough in order to get excited about an, an event. And we probably just went a little bit too early. Um, and then finally, I think it's taken us quite a long time in terms of the way that we communicate with with consumers to get the tone of voice right. I think the tone of voice that we have in our social media for um, for iHeart is, is absolutely spot on now, but it took us a while to understand how to get the message across and how to, to sort of really maximize the, the communication and excite the customers uh, via social media. And so it's, it's worth anybody just taking time to understand what your brand means to the consumer, not necessarily to you as the producer or the brand owner, but what it means to the consumer and therefore to get the tone of voice right with, particularly with social media. Yep. Got it. I think sometimes you are, you know, especially in, when you're experiencing this fast of a growth, you may be busy as well. I mean, you just were always busy instead of focusing on the tone. <laughs> Correct. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, all... because it's natural. It, you sort sort of change the tones where the money goes, right? Like you follow the money and you follow the supermarket's tone. Yeah, exactly. Got it, Robin. Uh, any any tips uh, you may have as a closing uh, remarks uh, for you know this young brand? I think um, I think certainly what's worked for us is is keeping it simple um, and remembering that you know the simplicity for for iHeart. And, and sort of consumer brands like this is, is what underpins the, the success of the brand in the first place and, and not to get too, too ahead of yourself. And, and I think we've done that particularly well. Um, for us, we, I explained that we're in a relatively unique position because we can source from any country, any winery. Um, but that flexibility has been, been great. But also to concentrate on quality and not to sacrifice um, quality in, um, in the pursuit of, of extra margin because when somebody buys your brand there is a trust involved and, and that trust as we discussed about the selection process for consumers that trust can only be reinforced if every time they're buying a bottle of wine it, it tastes as, as, as good as it possibly can be um, I think uh, having an in-depth knowledge of your consumers, I think that's vital. Uh, we do we do a lot of work with consumers, both with focus groups, but also you know we have a super group with uh, in social media. We we're constantly meeting consumers at brand fairs and and always getting their opinion. You said super group on social media. Yeah. Uh, what what's that like you have the, your cons, your loyal customers you keep asking feedback and learning from them exactly so it's it's uh we did a sort of selection process for people who wanted to to get more involved in the brand um and yes we you know we go to them if we're thinking about launching a new product or changing a blend or changing a label or, you know we just ask their opinion so that they're the people that that care the most and they're the people that are following us and, and they give us some, some very valuable feedback. Super. I think the key here in this whole thing is you are very close to your end consumer. You, and, and that's one of the things that you you understand, I guess. Completely. And that, I think that's, that's certainly very important for iHeart anyway.